Reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded. The first fireman on the scene found only a shell of the reactor building. Fire remains dangerous and difficult to put out. It was caused because cooling water was disrupted, so uranium pellets overheated and melted through metal pipes. This ignited... Satellite images show the area surrounding the nuclear power plant. They're not as high quality as intelligence photos might be, but analysts say these pictures indicate the fire is still burning. It also shows the smoke is heading in a northeasterly direction, but Moscow won't... The situation in hospital is getting desperate. Not so much place for everybody. Many dishes were still on tables, beds unmade, furniture and personal belongings abandoned. Those close to the reactor had fled for their lives and never returned. As of now, we cannot get local milk, butter, meat or vegetables anymore. We are ordered to bring back all supplies we have. There will probably be immediate death from the destruction of the nervous system. Others will suffer bleeding, blistering of the skin and intestinal and bone marrow damage which can kill within weeks. Those getting smaller doses... The Chernobyl story is still unfolding. Towns that were evacuated after the explosion at the nuclear power plant in the Ukraine are still empty, and people are paying for Chernobyl with their health. This is Babchin, a village about 30 kilometers north of Chernobyl. It was evacuated after the explosion and is now in a secure zone. No one knows how many people will eventually die from the effects of Chernobyl, but those numbers are continuing to rise and some of the latest victims are children. The explosion that rocked reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power station sent radioactive fallout around the world. People were at the mercy of the wind. Countries close to the Soviet Union received large doses of airborne particles. Even in North America, traces of radiation could be found. In Belarusia, the pattern of contamination was irregular. Areas closest to the power station were sometimes less affected than those farther away. The radiation given off by the fallout could not be seen, smelled, or tasted. Inhaled, it exposed internal organs to dangerous alpha radiation, while gamma rays easily passed through skin, making it impossible for cells to function or reproduce normally the body lost its immunity to infection and disease. For the Soviet Union, the full ramifications of this accident are still not clear. Once thriving towns are now deserted. Major portions of prime agricultural land lie fallow, too contaminated for crops, and hospitals are filled. Following the accident, 179 towns and villages were evacuated. People were told it would only be for three days. They were told to take some food and some warm clothes because they would probably have to sleep in buses. So many took what they were wearing and left everything else behind. For many, the evacuation came precious hours too late to stop the exposure they'd received. Children were allowed to play outside in the 24 hours immediately after the explosion. Pripyat is just 10 kilometers from the power station. For a day and a half, its 49,000 residents were told nothing of the dangers. <laughs> It was just usual day. We were walking. The weather was fine. Some children went to the bank of the river. They were swimming. No one was told anything. We knew there had been an accident, but we didn't know what to do. I went to the first secretary of the district party committee and he told me that the situation was okay, that I was panicking and that's why uh, I did not deserve to remain member of Komsomol organization, that's the Young Communist League. And uh, our village was evacuated only on the 5th of May. First of all, for a period of three days, there was no information at all. 
After that, they said it was okay. They said that it was not very severe tragedy, severe explosion. Only on Sunday, that was 36 hours after the accident, some ambulance cars started coming, and they were distributing some medicines. They warned us that the city would be evacuated. Just the same day on Sunday, buses started coming from Kyiv. They were coming to every house, taking people and evacuated them. There were very many buses, around 1,000. Ironically, the children of Pripyat, the nearest town to Chernobyl, had practiced emergency measures for such an accident only three days before. But on April 26th, not even the simplest measures were applied. Workers in the fields were subjected to unknown amounts of radioactive material. The food chain was contaminated, but because there was nothing else to eat, consumed anyway. Milk is important for infants and children, it would cause them to absorb up to eight times more radioactive iodide than adults. The village of Babchin is eerily quiet now. After the explosion of 1986, villagers found themselves inside a 30-kilometer restricted zone the government had set up around the power station. But life went on. They continued to work the land. They consumed their harvests. They even built new homes. It wasn't until the spring of 1988 that the villagers were moved. The first maps of radioactive contamination of the Republic, uh, Republic's territory were worked out by our personnel. I was uh, writing, I was drawing the attention to the fact that all the people should uh, be evacuated from the contaminated areas. If it uh, had been done, then uh, we wouldn't have such a dire situation we are in now. The situation is dire not only because of the slow response to the evacuation, but also because of the size of the problem. The black wing of the radioactive uh, pollution was spread above 20% uh, of the whole of the territory of Belarus. 27 cities and, uh, two, and more than 2,500 villages were affected by the disaster. It is very, very sad and grim thing to say, but we appeared to be uh, not ready to cope with the disaster of such immensity. Next, we'll meet a family living through the horror of the Chernobyl disaster. Some of the first people to be evacuated from the Chernobyl area were moved to Druzhny. It was ironic that a nuclear power station was being built there at the time of the explosion. Most of the signs extolling the virtues of nuclear energy were covered. The less visible one remains. The station was converted to gas before completion. 800 people came from Pripyat to make a new start. While they may be safer, life isn't easy. The conditions of life are really terrible. They've got a two-room flat, 29 square meters, and five children and four adults live there. We have two rooms. There live two families of nine people. The conditions are very terrible. There are fleas everywhere, and we're constantly drowned from the top apartment. When we came here and addressed to some authorities, they told us, why did you come here? We've got our own people who suffered from the Chernobyl accident. You should have stayed where you came from. We've got no nationality. We are no longer Ukrainians, Belarusians, or Russians. 
We are the Chernobyl people. My daughter was born on the 11th of April 1986, just two weeks before the accident. She catches colds very often. One of my children has got a terrible form of asthma and another has serious kidney problems. You have a prescription for certain medicine, but you can get it unless you wait half a year or a year. My child has problems with his heart, and I can't procure Reboxine. It's a special medicine for that. The state of health of my children is very poor now because uh, they've got problems with liver both and one of them has problems with nervous system as well. Our children have, are also complaining about uh, the pain in their legs but uh, doctors don't say anything about that. This is the children's doctor's office in the town of Druzhny. There's not much in it because it's hard to get the medicine and supplies to treat children with. The treatment can be successive until we have uh, vitamins and other uh, medicines prescribed uh, in the uh, necessary amounts. Up to now we have them, but uh, they are lacking. We have only small amounts of them. Of course, uh, there are very many cardiovascular diseases after the accident. Almost all of them have them. And also the thyroid gland is affected uh, in more than 50% of population. We are just the first uh, uh, link of the chain. We are consulting our patients and then they are treated in clinics in Minsk and in other towns and cities, in the Institute of Radiobiology and so on. Concerned about the health of their children, some mothers in Druzhny joined the Children of Chernobyl organization a grassroots movement trying to help the kids. Thousands of children have contracted cancer because of Chernobyl. In this register, we record data about the state of health of different children, about their problems, so that we know who needs help first, who can wait a little. And we also explain to mothers what should be done. We do this in order to help ourselves, because we don't expect any help from above. Although Druzhny is considered a clean area, residents are still very concerned about radiation levels. The appearance of our decimeter attracted a large crowd of mothers wanting their children to be checked. The decimeter measures the presence of radiation. Although most of the readings were relatively low, there was little optimism. I don't think about the future at all, because we have so many problems today. All the shops and stores are empty. We have got nothing to feed our children with, and it's impossible to think about future in a such a dire situation. I think that we are in for a spell of everything bad. I don't see any optimistic notes in our future. I am concerned very much about my children, about their future. I am idealist by nature and I want to fight for the future of our children. But I am afraid of even thinking of what waits for them. I am not sure whether our children will be mentally well, but I am sure about the fact that they will have inferiority complex. It is a very difficult question to answer whether they will be able to be mothers and fathers.
The resettled people in Druzhny are perhaps the luckier ones. 2.2 million still live in contaminated parts of the Republic. About 10,000 people live in Vetka. It's only 150 kilometers away from the Chernobyl power station. When we arrived, children were playing freely in the schoolyard, even though our decimeter registered a higher reading here than in the restricted zone. Our life hasn't changed. We do the same things. Nobody prohibits us from anything. We just continue to live on. We practically don't notice any changes now, but we are afraid that we will sense them in the future. We just continue to live our usual life. Everything goes as before. Of course, we are frightened by it because we understand that uh, severe consequences may arise. We don't feel quite well now. For example, I have got severe headaches now. Some feel dizzy and some are vomiting very often. Everyone is concerned about this. It's a global problem. We are the third group to be resettled, but up to now nothing is done about it. Just talk. We are taught some theoretical things, but it's impossible to implement them in our conditions. We all understand that the only thing that can help us is resettlement. The people here are waiting to be resettled. Two months ago, the elderly and families with young children were to have been moved to safer areas. However, that time passed and they are still here. They don't know why the resettlement wasn't done or if it will be. I don't believe that this program will ever be carried out because there are still children studying in this school who were supposed to have been resettled at the beginning of the year. One of the reasons may be cost. The government faces a monumental task moving the people it wants to. The program of the resettlement for the next five years costs 20 billion rubles. It includes the resettlement, the construction of the new houses on clean territories and, of course, all the necessary facilities for the life of the resettled people there. In school, children are taught about the dangers of radiation and the precautions they should take. But since radiation is an unseen enemy, many live their lives normally, as though it wasn't there. In what seemed a contradiction, a new wing was being built on the school, at the same time as authorities talked about evacuating families with young children. This money that was spent on the building of the school should have been used for the evacuation of people from here. At least, if we are still to remain here, then to build new houses for us. And there's another problem with resettlement. Some people who were to have moved refused, while others have snuck back. Most of them are older people who are willing to trade the dangers of contamination for the comfort of finishing their lives at home. After this break, the problems of eating contaminated food. It was considered that, because we were far from the Chernobyl atomic station, then that we shouldn't be affected by it. We continued to live as we had done before. There were no restrictions in the food or anything. Everything went its own way. Anatoly and Svetlana Lavor live in Molodeshno, a town in the northern part of the Republic. They're raising three girls in a small three-room apartment. 
First of all, we noticed that we were getting tired while working quicker than usual. Then a map appeared, and uh, on that map, we could see the places where mushrooms were contaminated. Then my friends and children started to get sick more often than before. We borrow a dosimeter from our friends, and we try to measure all the food we consumed. And, of course, a lot of food was contaminated. I think that we have no clean food at all. We try to take food from our parents' village, but the radiation level is still rather high there, too. Everything lacks in this country. There is a shortage of foodstuffs. That's why all the foodstuffs brought here, in this town, and everywhere, are not checked at all. And nobody knows what he is eating. Living in these conditions is very stressful. They're also worried about the lack of information they receive. All the information is classified and it's concealed. We are told every day, don't worry, everything is okay. But it is a case in our country when nobody answers for anything and nobody knows what to do. Figures differ in various newspapers. Just some days ago, our local paper published one figure and the regional newspaper published quite the other. Maladechne is considered to be a rather clean town, but we know of some cases of people that got sick and one of them died already. The situation that we are all in is genocide. Now, I am afraid of everything. I don't believe anyone. And the grief of the family is enormous. Chernobyl has touched the Lavores in many ways. The most tragic is the way it's affected their youngest daughter. Yelena is just seven months old and has leukemia. When Yelena was three months old, she was vaccinated, and two weeks later, her legs and arms started to ache. It was impossible to touch them. Then she got into the hospital with neurotoxicosis, and after that, leukosis developed. My daughter has undergone chemotherapy. Now she is supposed to undergo another round, but I am afraid that she is very weak. She won't be able to survive another course of chemotherapy. She has got no chance at all if she is treated only here, in Belarus. We'd like to treat our daughter somewhere abroad, because there they have some 60% chance of success from bone marrow transplantation. And in a case of chemotherapy, up to 85% of the patients are cured. My daughter needs help badly, but in this country there is no diagnostic equipment no medical instruments, and no drugs to treat her properly. Many parents feel the same way. They say the only hope for their children is to be treated abroad, where knowledge and technology is better. Nothing is being done by the government, because they don't even think of their people. In the Ministry of Health Protection, they ask us, what do you want? Leukosis is not cured in our country. We don't have a lot of money. 
Our parents tried to help. Once I was given a bonus of 120 rubles from the plant I work at. We have been told that it would cost 200,000 US dollars to treat Yelena. That is why we have no hope that we could gather the sum here. Yelena spends many hours playing with her two older sisters. Anna and Olga are both healthy now, but so is Yelena four months ago. Their mother also fears for them. I am afraid of checking their health again. Now they are more susceptible to various colds than they were before. They only know that she is seriously ill. They care about her, help her, and that's all. Anatoly has another serious thing to worry about. Not only is his daughter sick, his wife is as well. Svetlana also has cancer. Yelena is treated here at hospital number one in Minsk. She spends two weeks in hospital receiving chemotherapy, two weeks at home and so on. Like other mothers, Svetlana stays at her daughter's bedside. This is the Republic's main hospital for treating diseases like leukemia and blood cancers in children. But it's not enough. While there are beds for 60 children here, 180,000 children in the Ukraine and Belarus have gotten cancer from Chernobyl. There are shortages of medicine. There is even a lack of simple things like wheels for intravenous stands, forcing children to lie on their backs for days. The head of the department is also the doctor who treats Yelena. She has more optimism for the child if she can be treated outside the country. Now she's at home. Uh, in a few days she will come uh, for the next course of uh, hemotherapeutic uh, treatment. Mm. These parents uh, want to go to Austria for bone marrow transplantations. I think that it will be successful with, with uh, this child and uh, she must live. The cancers are developing more rapidly in children than adults. Doctors say that's because the children's organisms are more vulnerable to radiation. Their immune systems are not fully developed, so they suffer earlier than adults. Some are affected before they're born, while others get sick later. First of all, they lose their appetite. They want to sleep. They are weak. Their bones are aching. Their liver and other internal organs are enlarged. And of course, some changes in the blood occur. Four-year-old Anatoly Kosyakov was born two months before the Chernobyl accident. He and his twin brother were healthy, active babies. However, his brother got a rare form of leukemia in January 1989 and died a year later. Now, Anatoly also has it. Now, I think that this uh, child has the chance because uh, two months ago we studied uh, proto uh, West uh, European protocols, BFM. Uh, before uh, this, uh, we cured our children in our protocols, which g uh, gave us only 50 percent uh, then children can be healthy after these protocols. But the hospital had only 14 grams of methadroxate, the drug needed for that treatment. That was not enough for Anatoly or the other children. Doctors check the children often. This boy has been sick for three years.
This boy was treated with our uh, own protocols, our Soviet protocols, but we were not successful in this treating because um, he has three relapses of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But now we started new German protocol and he is much more better. You can see that uh, he has uh, such um, arms because of infection in the veins uh, after catheters. Doctors say clean, disposable needles might reduce that, but they don't have them. Needles cost 10 rubles, but the patients get only 2 rubles a day from the government, so the needles are used over and over. Mothers call the government's offering coffin money. This child also very sick because he has uh, phenylcatenuria and um, aplastic anemia. Also, I think that in future he need bone marrow transplantation. <laughs> this is the child with acute erythromyeloblastic leukemia. He's only a week here. He's a new patient. I don't know what will be uh, the chance of this child, but I hope that we can cure him also. Down the hall, another doctor was examining a seven-year-old girl. She's got the acute leukosis. She's been sick for two years already. She's got a very hard condition now. The nervous system is affected. Now she undergoes the treatment under the BFM protocol, the uh, special treatment for the repeated illnesses. We hope for success, of course. The doctor's remarks were quite hopeful, but when we left the room, he told us a different story. He said the girl would likely die. She didn't want to tell in front of her and her mother. She's got very little hope to recover. First of all, her state is very difficult now, very complicated. And secondly, uh, the therapeutic procedures were very hard. The doctor went on to talk about some of the medical problems with this child. He said her blood is lacking some vital components and the hemoglobin is very low. They've tried to help by giving her a blood transfusion, but the risk of hemorrhaging is very high. That's the main cause of death among these patients, and the girl could die at any time. On average, two to three children die each week at this hospital. Mothers stay at the hospital, offering the love and support their children so desperately need. But they feel helpless as they watch their children suffer. This child was treated with some hormone drugs, but they had practically no effect. They just made her fat. This mother says that her little girl is suffering very much from leukemia. Her limbs and her back are very sore. And this mother is sick and tired of being in the hospital. She's been here four months without going home. A lot is needed. Medicines, first of all. Equipment, medical equipment is badly needed. There are problems with the personnel and a lot of economic problems with our health protection system. There are many signs of those needs at this hospital. Although only 15 years old, it's in a state of decay. The entrance, nothing more than a plywood door. The building is drafty and cold, further complicating the critically low levels of immunity in the children. Its treatment room is short of medicine. Much of it comes from outside the country. Some Soviet medicines are nothing more than sugar water. 
Gauze masks shield children from infection, while other people move through the hospital with no masks or measures to prevent infection from being spread. Even a cold can be critical. The we are appealing to the people of Canada and to the people of uh, goodwill in all the countries of the world to help us with the medical products. We must live, uh, we must be healthy, and especially our children must be healthy. And we do all our best uh, in my work and uh, in our work uh, to do children healthy. It's a cruel irony that children are suffering so much, for they lead a privileged life in Soviet society. Childhood is a time to be carefree, to run and play, to live for the moment. Children are continually told that the future is theirs and that the state spares no expense preparing them for it. The explosion at the Chernobyl reactor changed that for many thousands. The medical problems now afflicting the children are perhaps the biggest tragedy of all. Coming up, we look at the problem of resettlement in the contaminated areas. Chernobyl's illnesses are not just confined to children, nor are they all leukemia. Adults suffer too. Malnutrition, poor treatment facilities and stress all weaken their defenses against other forms of disease. Respiratory problems are also increasing. I can uh, remember one case. Uh, it happened just three months ago when I was working in a polyclinic yet. And uh, a man of 40 came to me and uh, some two years ago he was helping his mother who lives in, a, in an area affected by Chernobyl radiation. He said that his throat had been aching for three months already, but he uh, didn't pay any attention to this. He was sent uh, to the hospital for the examination, and the diagnosis was that uh, he had the cancer of pharynx. The interesting fact about this is that he's been working in this area only for one month. And you see what the result is. While those diseases used to show up at 60, many people are now contracting them at 40. Doctors are frustrated with the government's response to the figures. Our Ministry of Health registers the higher frequency of uh, diseases of respiratory system and also of oncological diseases of the same system, especially in Gomel and Mogilov regions. But our uh, authorities are reluctant to connect these figures with the Chernobyl accident. Belarusia lost 20% of its farmland to Chernobyl. While many farms were abandoned, crops continue to be grown on some. Officials say most of the problem now comes from eating contaminated food. All uh, people in our republic eat contaminated food and I myself also uh, eat such food because I want to live and I don't want uh, to die because of hunger. Now as before, a lot is being concealed, hushed up, especially what concerns the contamination of foods, about the danger and about what is ahead of us. The situation with uh, food is uh, really dire because uh, we don't see any vegetables or fruit all year round. Uh, the same we, uh, I can say about uh, juices. Nobody takes our foodstuffs, our products. Once, Belarusia used to be a prosperous republic, one of the richest in the country. But now, all the republics, all cities and towns refuse to take our foodstuffs. That is why we consume everything ourselves. 
People were glad on the 1st of May because sausage was sold in the nearest shop. People were very glad. After some time passed, they learned that this was sausage that Moscow had refused to accept. We get 80% of radiation with our foodstuffs. That is why uh, people from all the areas where the readings of that uh, uh, instrument would be over 60 should be resettled. As a doctor, I know that uh, to live in the region uh, when the earth is contaminated, to eat contaminated food, it is very dangerous for future, for health uh, and especially for children. Doctors say the problem would be lessened if people could measure contamination in their food. For two years following the accident, it was illegal for people to have decimeters. Even now there are very few of them. There is the state network of uh, uh, monitoring the foodstuffs, but the foodstuffs that are produced privately and uh, consumed by the producers are practically not checked. I consider that each and every family should own this kind of a measuring instrument. If we knew the uh, radioactive background of a certain area and uh, if we could monitor all the foodstuffs consumed on it, we could uh, know exactly what is the level of uh, the radiation population gets there. People believe that clean food is crucial. Cattle, which were fed uncontaminated feed for two months, produced clean meat. Doctors think there would be a similar improvement in people if they had clean food. The Children of Chernobyl is one of the main child help groups in Belarusia. Among the many things it does is try to get clean food and treatment for children by sending them to foreign countries. The committee was the first to begin the practice of sending children affected by radiation to be taken abroad for the treatment. To this day, we have managed to treat 5,000 children abroad. We organize the treatment of children from affected areas in Austria, Germany, France and Norway. The people of Belarusia are crying for help after this. There isn't an easy solution to the problems caused by Chernobyl. More children will get sick and more will die. As time goes on, nature will clean the land. But there will be more illness as the diseases start appearing in adults. This story has no happy ending. It underscores the very real dangers in the nuclear age. The people of Belarusia are crying for help. I want to ask all the Canadians and the people all over the world to help us because the children are suffering too much. It's such a big problem in our country. I ask not only for my daughter, but for all the Belarusian and Soviet children who have suffered after the Chernobyl accident. But our prime concern is the health of our children, the children of Belarusia, first of all, and Ukraine too. Because when your children are not healthy, you can't uh, think of your own health. So we don't know what must be done, but we ask you to help us keep our children healthy. It's a such a mess now in this country that practically no attention is paid to the patients. And uh, foreign help is extremely necessary either to take patients to other countries or to teach our doctors so that they know what to do with those people who have been affected by radiation. And of course, medicines and medical equipment is necessary. 
If you can, please, we will accept any help, probably in medicines, or maybe you can invite some people, at least just a few of them, to treat them in Canada. I'd like to address all the people that live abroad, all the people of goodwill. I want them to face me and help me to cure my child. The conditions are very hard here and leukosis is practically incurable here in the Soviet Union. I'll pray that uh, people that will help me who will face me and help my only son. Since the taping of this documentary, none of the children we met have shown any improvement. Sergei has developed an infection in his lungs and is very weak. Seven-year-old Frolenko has died. Oh, 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 oh,